Good evening, everybody. I'm Eric Aitman. Uh, I'm co-director of the Digital Economy Lab, uh, which is one of the hosts of this event. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Dave Birch to you, and I'm very happy he was uh, able to accept our invitation. As those of you who haven't seen him before will agree with, uh, in an hour once you've seen his talk, which I'm sure is going to be both entertaining and interesting. Uh, Dave is a global ambassador. I don't know whether that means to the globe or of the globe. I don't do any work. <laughs> but uh, he's, a, and hard to get that <coughs> he's a consultant who uh, specializes in, well, it's going to be so many things, it's not going to sound like specialization, but telecoms, money, uh, yeah, all the big stuff, media. Uh, basically, Dave looks at what's going on and figures out what's really going on and then tells people. And uh, he That's does so. Uh, inimitably, I think is the word. Uh, he's spoken at the college a number of times in the past, always brilliantly, and I'm sure he's going to do so again for you now. You're much too kind, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the, the idea of this session is because, um, uh, broadly speaking, um, I'm old and you're young. So I think I've spotted a bit of a, a flaw. Uh, in what's going on at the moment, and I'm not quite sure what to do about it, but I'm pretty sure some of the budding entrepreneurs uh, sitting around the business school right now uh, will be able to figure this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, give a couple of practical examples, just, just to sort of anchor where we are. Um, uh, then I'm going to talk uh, sort of generally about uh, uh, structuring um, what, what the problem is at a sort of higher level. Um, and then I'm going to make a suggestion as to, as to one plausible hypothesis for fixing it, um, which you're going to, uh, to then take away and turn into something brilliant. So um, just, just for the privacy aware, you are being filmed while this is going on. I just noticed at the back. Does anyone know who this guy is? Just out of curiosity. Because so. yeah, I mean, he doesn't look familiar at all. So. Um, <clears throat> so, but you know, if you're very nervous about it, you can just pass me little notes on scraps of paper. You don't have to use your real names, uh, but if you want to, just put your hand up, and I'll do my best to answer the questions. And please do interrupt as I'm going along, because I'm not entirely sure where this is going to meander to. And, and without you to sort of nudge it in the right direction, uh, you know, the hour might uh, end up in a very different place. So please feel free to interject at the appropriate points. <coughs> so, they call it the Internet of Things, uh, I call it the Internet of Everyone Else's Things. And the reason I call it that is because the people who are putting together the Internet of Things are, broadly speaking, people like me. Um, technologists, um, and as a consequence, we get carried away with the excitement of what the technology can do, and we go around hooking everything up, um, and we haven't really thought through what's going to happen when we've hooked everything up. And, um, and the reason we do this is because it's a highly asymmetric thing, <coughs> which I'll show you in a minute. So broadly speaking, building doors is quite easy, uh, but building locks is quite hard. I'm used to talking to marketing people. If this is too slow for you, <laughs> just, uh, just nudge me along a little bit. So just go back to my metaphor. So building doors is actually quite easy, but building locks is really quite difficult. And this is the asymmet asymmetry that's at the heart of the problem. So um, you don't need me to run through this. Let's get on with it. So here's a, here's a simple case study of the Internet of Things, which I think is quite a good case study, which is very useful in many different ways. So uh, is there anybody in the audience that can read the, any of these labels? There's nobody here from South Korea. Oh, well, that, my joke doesn't work then. I'll have to <laughs> stage, and we'll walk back into that again. OK, so here, uh, is a, here is a good example of the Internet of Things working. So in South Korea, uh, I'm reliably informed, um, there's a terrible problem with counterfeit Scotch whiskey. Scotch whiskey is a, is a prized import uh, for our foreign visitors who, who don't follow the economics of these things. You have to understand, in the United Kingdom, there is more, bon uh, there is more whiskey value in uh, what they call bonded warehouses, is where the customs duties come from, than there is gold in the Bank of England. That used to be a funny joke, but if you remember Gordon Brown, 
sold it all off at a rock bottom price a few years ago. So it would be obviously be true. It's even more true now than it was before. Whiskey is an extremely valuable export, and one of the places we export it to is South Korea. Uh, but there's a terrible problem with counterfeit Scotch whiskey, because imagine the disappointment um, if you took home one of those bottles, uh, having saved up for some time for it, and when you get it home, you take your first glass and you realise this is terrible counterfeit knockoff. Actually, I don't know where do they make knockoff whiskey? I got to the end of that story, and I didn't think to look that bit up. But wherever they make terrible counterfeit knockoff whiskey, I know London possibly. <laughs> wherever they make t terrible counterfeit knockoff whiskey from, this might well have come from there, and that would be dreadful. Um, and so, uh, so they came up with a jolly clever solution to this. So the bottle caps have an RFID chip inside them, um, and uh, there's you can't do it with all phones. You have to have one of the special phones, but. Um, uh, this is an in, there's an international standard for these RFID chips, uh, and you can read them either with the phone or with the Bluetooth device that's attached to the phone. So you go to the shop, so let's just say phone for sake of argument to speak. Of. So you go to the shop, and you can take your phone, and you can touch the bottle of Scotch whiskey, and your phone can tell you uh, whether it's a legitimate bottle of excellent Scotch whiskey or some appalling knockoff counterfeit uh, from somewhere else. And if you think, and how do you think it does that, just out of curiosity? This is, I've tried some business school thinking here. I'm not picking on anyone in particular, but would anyone like to venture a get? I mean, how does it know? Like, when you wait, like, pretend, don't think about how the technology works, right? Just imagine, imagine there are pixies living in the Scotch whiskey bottle <laughs> who can talk to elves that live in your phone, right? What would they, so how do you know it's real? Because obviously, the pixies that live in the counterfeit bottles of Scotch whiskey are also going to say that they're real, right? So you have to. So it, the answer is not that simple. So, just, so the pixies that live in the Scotch whiskey bottle are talking to the elves who live in your phone. So what are they going to say to convince your phone that it's real Scotch whiskey and not some appalling counterfeit? It's the barcode. Well, um, yes. Except unfortunately, <laughs> barcodes are rather trivial to copy. So if I was a if I was a desperado engaged in large-scale counterfeit Scotch whiskey smoke, what I would do is just go and read some real barcodes and copy them and put them into my bottles of knockoff hooch. So it can't be as simple as the barcode. But that's a good start to the thinking. Right? Still, but it's going to say some number, numbers they're going to have to go to the manufacturer and come back and say, yes, they, it. correct. Yeah, exactly. So it's what happened? But it's been better than the other option. But did you know how this works, or were you just, you just thinking about it right. through? Yeah, that's impressive. Well done. So the, uh, it's imperial, come on. So, uh, but the issue, you're exactly right, of course. There's no way the bottle can attest itself to the fact that it's absolutely not a counterfeit. Because, and in fact, there's a, there was a case in the UK like this with wine. Remember those, br the, the names got out of my head. Those Italian brothers. They were putting these pretend labels on. Gallo. 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 <laughs> the, these bottles of wine were $14,000 a bottle, right? It's not the sort of thing that I would normally... You'd have to go to the staff room to see that kind of thing around here. We wouldn't, you know, students wouldn't necessarily see that kind of thing. But there are bottles of wine that are $14,000. And so what they would do was just putting plonk in the bottles and sticking the labels on to do the same thing. And they had a barcode on them as well. Yeah, so what happens is um, your, f your phone reads a unique number from the chip. And then the phone goes online to a database and says, Broadly speaking, do you think this is real or not? And the database can say, uh, well, actually, if that is that bottle, then that bottle was manufactured on this date, and it was shipped through this distributor, and it ended up in this store, right? So your phone then compares what it's just been told with, so for example, if I scan this and it said, well, this was made on such and such a date, and it went to this warehouse, it went to this distribution center, and as far as we know, it went to Tesco, and I'm standing in Tesco, then it's a plausible hypothesis that this is a valid bottle of whiskey, and we can all move on. Uh, and in fact, the system's slightly even cleverer than that, actually, because when you open, the, the chip is actually in the bottle cap, with the antenna in the bottle cap. So when you open the bottle, when you, it breaks the chip. So once you've opened the bottle, the chip is broken and can't be reused. That's quite a clever sort of idea. Um, but suppose I can't afford that really fantastic whiskey. 
And so I've invited Eric round for dinner. And I know he really likes whiskey, but I know he's also a bit of a poser. <laughs> I know he wouldn't really know whether this was the really nice whiskey or the knockoff hooch, right? So I produce a bottle of the really nice whiskey, but it's actually got the knockoff hooch inside. And I serve him a glass of it, and everything is absolutely fine until his nosy, busybody wife uh, takes her phone out and scans the bottle and says, wait a minute, that's not the... Oops. So putting an RFID chip in the bottle solves one of the problems, but it causes quite a few others because anybody can read that, right? So, sorry, you're going to... I was just going to say... I would never read really it. I was just... No, no, but I, I've bought it from them. See, I know that these really were knockoff hooch bottles, you see? So what the mafia have done is they've gone and got a whole load of the bottles and the caps, filled them up with the knockoff hooch, and then put the tops on. Uh, and so I, I know full well that it's not the real stuff. I'm just banking that Eric won't know. But imagine the social embarrassment when he finds out. And what's more, he can prove it because he's got access to the database that it really is knockoff. You've got to think this through a <coughs> And, you know, it's um, that database, by the way, then, of course, becomes the vector for attack. Because, actually, <coughs> what the chips are, you said barcodes. I mean, in reality, all the chips are is barcodes that you can't copy, right? The reason you can't copy them is because you can't make duplicates of the chips. I have to steal the chips from the factory. I can't make copies myself. Um, but, uh, but it's hard to attack those. So, what, of course, if I was the bad guys, I would attack the database. Right? So now if I'd like thought this through, I'm gonna serve the whiskey to Eric, but I know his wife's a busybody, she's got one of these phones. So what I would do is I would log into the database first and change the database. So the database says that it's the real whiskey. And then when his wife touches the whiskey bottle and goes through, that's a relief. Okay, good. So I, I know I can get away with this now. But you see the point of the story, right? Which is you know, in the smarts, you go around putting chips in everything, and that sounds good. But when you actually start to think of the use cases and how that's going to turn into an actual business, because we have to go with the grain of something that's going to be a business to make all of this work. You know, Angela's high for losing ideals about privacy and so on. I mean, unless it's a business, it's not going to happen. So we have to think of ways to make that into a business. But that's a real example, okay? So that is one way of doing it. But now suppose, suppose it's not bottle of whiskey. Suppose, suppose it's pants. Pants is another good example for thinking about it. So, um, so I go down to Marks and Spencers, and I buy pants that have got a chip in them. And I would cheerfully, I would cheerfully pay more for pants that have a chip in them than pants that don't. Because one of the things the chip in the pants will say is you have to put this on like a cold wash or a hot wash or a warm wash. You can't mix it with these different colors or whatever. And I guess uh, your hands on might be different. I would say on a rough barometer, uh, having, been, having been married for a quarter of a century, uh, there's probably been more arguments in my house about putting the wrong stuff in the washing machine than anything else put together. I'm not making a genderist point, but the way they design washing machines is very confusing <coughs> for them. It's very... They have a dial with labels on it. You know, it's, of course, it's in, it's in the utility room in our house. It's a little bit dark. You can't always see these things properly. And I don't. You know, you're not supposed to put the blue in with the turquoise. How am I supposed to know what's blue and what's like? Would you say that was blue or teal? I don't know. Or even turquoise. See, it's very confusing because we have different receptors. I'm not making a genderist point. It's just the way things work. So I would cheerfully pay more for pants that had a chip in them and a washing machine that could read those chips. Who, seriously, who here would not pay more? Put your hand up if you would not pay more for a washing machine that could read the chips in pants. Of course you would. Would you get, all right, let's do it. Would you pay, would you pay 50 pounds more for a washing machine that could do that? Of course you would. There's your business idea right there. What are you doing sitting around in here? You should, you should have an emergency on-call patent lawyer right now for this. That's what happens around here, right? That's exactly, you should be working on that idea right now. The washing machine should read the chips in the pants, 
and stop these terrible accidents from happening, right? So I come down, I put all the pans in the washing machine, and I press the button, and the washing machine says no, and it sends a little message to my phone which says, you've got to take the black pants out because the white pants only wash or whatever, right? Something that's easier for me to understand. Who wouldn't pay more for pants that could do that and a washing machine that could do that? Of course you would, we all would. It's an absolute inevitability. No, I'm, I'm serious, it is an absolute inevitability. Now, um, I said Marks and Spencers, uh, that's one of the cases that we refer to in here. So Marks and Spencers actually did have tags, well, in fact, they do have tags in clothing. And those tags work, uh, work really well. That's washing the machine, he's got it here. And they do work really well. Um, but all these privacy people made a big fuss about this, right? So there were people like Angela who said, uh, well, putting these tags in pants, well, that's not a very good idea. Because what if other people read them? Because it's all very well, but Marks and Spencers. So I come along with a big pallet of pants in Marks and Spencers, and the machine at Marks and Spencers can read all of the tags in all of the pallet of pants at once and know what they all are, and that's great. But what if you've got one of those machines? That doesn't sound quite right again. The machines that Mark, so let's stop talking about Marks and Spencers. If you just think about how those chips work in general, you're all pretty familiar with how the 900 megahertz EPC chips work, right? So there's a read range on those things, depending on the power of the readers, 25 to 30 meters. The readers can read thousands of these things a second. So you could drive a, you could drive a truckload full of pants through one of the readers, and the readers would just in a fraction of a second read all of them, and they would know exactly what pants are there. And that's why we want the technology, right? Because, because it tells us exactly what's going on. And that's good for our supply chain. But the privacy moaners said, oh, well, you have to make the tags so that after you buy the pants, the tag doesn't work anymore. Right? So, so other people can't. And I thought, well, but that's not right, because that means all the benefits of having those tags in the pants accrues to Marks and Spencers, and none of it accrues to me. I want the tag in my pants, or at least I want the choice whether to have a tag in my pants. Besides, it would be sort of fun. Like, if I went round to Eric's for dinner, it would be considered um, pretty inappropriate. We're English, and we're very reserved about these kind of things. So if I just went upstairs and started looking through Eric's pants drawer, uh, people would consider that, well, some people would probably say, well, I don't know if you'd say anything, because you're English, but you would look disapprovingly at people who went and started looking through the pants drawer. You would tut, probably, about that sort of thing. And I, he wouldn't invite me back. That I could be sure about. But I would never find out why. <laughs> I would just not be on the Christmas card list anymore. But if your phone could read the pack, I mean, come on. It would be, I mean, who wouldn't do that? You're at the dinner table. It's a boring dinner party. I'm dying to know whether that really is a Chanel suit or not. I couldn't resist having a quick look on my phone just to see whether Eric's suit is real or not. And while I'm doing that, I can't help noticing those pants looking a little dated. Pants have been around for a while. And it's odd, because looking upstairs, there seem to be a lot of new pants stacked up. <laughs> so putting chips in things sounds like quite a good idea until you start thinking through the use cases. And then it starts to sound a little bit. I'll give you another example. Suppose, suppose I had, I don't wear a watch, because I'm trying to be hip and down with the kids. And I read in a magazine that kids don't wear watches anymore. So see, I'm, I'm blending with the audience. It's a little technique I learned. So I'm not wearing a watch. Um, but suppose I had a very expensive Rolex watch, right, that cost 5,000 pounds. I really want people to know, right? The whole point of being an arsehole walking around with a 5,000 pound Rolex watch is I want everyone to know it's a 5,000 pound Rolex watch, right? Otherwise, where's the fun? What's the point of having the 5,000 pound Rolex watch if no one knows it's a real 5,000 pound Rolex watch? It could be the 50 quid one I got in Hong Kong, which looks exactly the same, right? But I'm a real arsehole. So, I mean, I want people to know 
I want you to come and scan that Rolex with your phone and find out that it's a real £5,000 Rolex and not some kind of knockoff. And because I'll pay £5,000 for the Rolex watch that can do that, I'll pay £5,500 for the Rolex watch that can broadcast the fact that it's real. So there's a commercial pressure for things to do this, right? And to, because we're human beings and that's the sort of thing that we'll do. Of course, if I was a burglar, the first thing I would do is start driving up and down the street near where Eric lives with my phone looking for where all the $5,000 Rolex watches are. <clears throat> so swings and roundabouts is what I'm saying about this sort of thing. So the question is, is this, a, is this an irresolvable paradox or is there a way to get through this? Is there a way of having the $5,000 Rolex watch which tells people that I want to know that it's a $5,000 Rolex watch, that's a $5,000 Rolex watch, but not telling the people that I don't want to know that it's a $5,000 watch, whether it's a $5,000 Rolex watch or not. You see what I mean? Like, is that a paradox, or is there some way through this? And this is kind of what I want to exper experiment on with you. I should say, I won't show you the video, because I, I don't want to get involved in any sort of messy lawsuits, you know, but we did as an experiment, we did do, we made a little video because we thought it would be a fun idea for a nightclub thing, that when you went into a nightclub, you could have a thing that scanned people's pants because, like for example, like if I was trying to find attractive women in a nightclub, then knowing that I had clean pants on, I think would be like a plus point for me, so I'd want them to be able to scan and find out. And it will put me in advantage against the people who I pretty much suspect don't have clean that could be a big plus point. So we made a little video of scanning various types of chips through the clothes. It was very interesting. We discovered, and there's no pattern. Maybe the physics department helped us out on this. We couldn't figure out why some chips would read through some kinds of fabric, but not through others. I, I mean, it's a genuine question. I genuinely don't know why it was. And there was no, it wasn't like it was all cotton or all nylon or something. Some things you could read the chips through and some things you couldn't. Uh, but I think we need to get the physics department onto this one. Because unless you could read all of the patterns, then you would think people were hiding something. You know what I mean? Like, if you came into the nightclub and you could see that Eric's pants were new, but my pants were cryptographically blinded, <laughs> then you'd think I was hiding something. That would be your natural conclusion, right? And that could take us down a very unfortunate path. So. so we have to think of all aspects of this. Now, I'm using pants as a, wait a minute, not a metaphor nor an analogy. I'm using them as a class example. Pants are a fun example to talk about, but for pants, read everything, right? For pants, read your electricity meter, your car, your phone, everything about you in this connected Internet of Things crazy mixed up world, right? So just remember the picture of the pants, because that's how serious the problem is. But it's not just pants, it's everything. Pants are just a way of focusing your attention. I'm not just talking about pants. I'm talking about all sorts of personal items. OK, right. So that's illustrated a couple of the issues, I think. So set <coughs> stage two. So now let's talk about the general problem. Remember what I said about the door and the lock. So the general problem is that connecting things up is quite easy, which is why people like me do it. Um, and uh, so here's an example. <laughs> I made a list of things. I started making a list, and I thought that was too boring. Um, but the first one, I thought I'd make a nice picture. So this is, this is one of my favorite pictures. So this is the men from the general post office coming to expect Mr. Marconi's radio equipment on the occasion of the first long distance, by which I mean three mile, uh, radio transmission in the United Kingdom. And the men from the post office have come down to, to, to investigate uh, this one, and that's why I like that picture. Uh, but broadly speaking, for quite a long time, connecting things together has been really rather easy. And it doesn't particularly matter, for the purposes of what we're thinking about here, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about you know, the internet or wireless or radio or Bluetooth or RFID or whatever. It's just connection is the issue. Connecting things together is easy. It's, it's irresistible to connect things together. You, you, did anybody here go to Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in February? Um, there's an amazing array of things being connected to phones. 
for no obvious reason that I could see other than that you could do it. Right? So I'm looking at these things and I'm like, why would you want to connect that to your phone? It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it's because you can, basically. I think that's what Billy Elliot, Bluetooth Low Energy. You guys are already playing around with Bluetooth Low Energy, right? So, you know, you can have these little Bluetooth Low Energy connectors that will run for two or three years without having a battery charge, right? One of the examples I saw yesterday, there's a company that's got a little ring, a little uh, a payments ring that you can put on that will last for about three years before the battery runs out. One of the art students that had uh, in our competition designed one a couple of years ago, which I thought was quite clever. He had a Bluetooth uh, smart ring with a little spike inside it. And every time you used your credit card to buy something, the spike pricked you. Because <laughs> he, he was doing a project about trying to make electronic money into something tactile again. And I thought that was a, just a terrific. Because it's a well-known psychological problem. You spend more money electronically than you'll spend with physical cash. So the idea was if you had a spike that was pricking you every time you spent something, it would bring back the reality of physical cash. But the point is, a ring like that could last two or three years uh, one charge. So we can connect things up quite easily. I mean, the range on that is quite long, actually. So you've probably looked at what some of the retailers are doing at the moment. So if you have a phone that's got Bluetooth Low Energy, like my iPhone has got Bluetooth Low Energy, if you've got a Samsung S4 or S5, that's got BLA. There's lots of phones that have got Bluetooth Low Energy there. So basically, when I walk into a shop, not only does the shop know that I'm in the shop, it knows exactly where I am. Because if you put three of these beacons around the shop so that the phone can triangulate where it is, then the app can send it back. You, you can be tracked to within centimeters. So now I'm walking around with my Waitrose app. Sorry, my Lidl app. Let's just, I don't want to alienate anybody. And I'm walking around with my Lidl app here, and now Lidl knows exactly what I'm standing in front of. Not just that I'm in the shop. And now for me, that would be fantastic, because I would like my shopping app on my phone to be able to help me find my way around the store and optimize my, right? So when you've done your shopping list, the app would then tell you, you need to go this way, this way. That'd be great, right? You can make, make a note of that one as well. This is a brilliant <laughs> idea too. <coughs> one of the fun things about Bluetooth Low Energy is it works using unique numbers, right? So if you go into a shop and you find out which numbers the beacons are broadcasting, you can set any device to broadcast those numbers. So, so there was a good example at, uh, at CES earlier in the year in Las Vegas. You could get a prize for going around the different stalls, right? So if you went around 10 of the different stalls, like Nokia and Microsoft or whatever, you could win a prize. And they had an app, and it was using these blue... So because what happened? So the first guy that walks around goes around, collects all the beacon numbers, puts them on the internet, and then millions of people around the world just sit in front of their laptops going, beep, 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 oh, I won a prize. You know, I mean, it wasn't a big prize, but you get the point. But I think it could be very funny to like sit on the sit on the train with a couple of these phones and make the phone broadcast so that the people in the train carriage think, or at least their phones think, that they're inside McDonald's or something. I, mean, it just, I think it'll add to the gaiety of the nation. I'm not sure. <laughs> the point is, it's easy. Connecting things up is just easy. Now, in the Internet of Things, we're not just connecting things up. We're connecting things up, but we have to be able to uniquely address them. Otherwise, it don't, doesn't count as the Internet of Things, right? So strictly speaking, if you're just connecting things together, but you don't know what they are and you can't uniquely identify them, then that's just like the Internet of Stuff. That doesn't really count. To be the Internet of Things, you've got to be able to identify the thing that you're connecting up. It doesn't matter what it is. So here's a box of stuff in my office. There's something in the box of stuff in my office. It's the thing I'm looking for. Where are my keys? Where's my, well, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what I'm looking for. Whatever it is I'm looking for, right? <coughs> I can now find it. I walk, I've got my phone. Oh, it's in that box over there. I go, that's the internet of things. You have to be able to address things uniquely. There's a little bit more to it because the things that you, so sorry, I'm building up my argument of what counts as the internet of things as opposed to just stuff. Right? So I've got to be able to uniquely identify something. It's a bottle of scotch whiskey. It's the pen I was looking for. It's my camera, whatever. Um, but I've also got to be able to understand what the properties of it are. Otherwise, it's pointless 
being able to interact with it. So if you look at, for example, if you look, if for, for experimental purposes, if you use Bluetooth Low Energy for experimental purposes, one of the first things you learn about it is you, you have a thing, a set of things, a properties that you can, right? So if I see your, if I see your Bluetooth thingy, one of the things I can do with it is interrogate it and say, what can you do? And the Bluetooth thingy will say, I, you know, I can give you a temperature, I can give you a location, I mean, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. So it's useful if the thing has some properties. I mean, I suppose you could argue that doing nothing is one of the properties. Um, but yeah, I mean, the Scotch whiskey example we were looking at earlier on, the only property is the unique identifying number for the, you know, it's got to do something, otherwise what's the point of the damn thing? It's just have a property. But as you pointed out, really, at the beginning, unless we have provenance as well, we can't do very much with these two things, right? So this, is, so this is my generalized concept. The Internet of Things, the thing, has to have some kind of unique thing, product, has to have some properties, but it has to have some kind of provenance, because otherwise none of, neither of these things will be believable or usable in any way. So we, we have to have this third point. And of course, the point of the discussion, they have to have some security, because if those three things don't have security, because it's our mantra, Angela, isn't it? You can't have privacy without security. You can have security without privacy, but you can't have privacy without security. So unless these things are secure, we have no privacy. And right now, I think the current state of affairs is these things are not secure, and so you can blather on about privacy to your heart's content, but you're not gonna get any because the basic building blocks aren't there. So we have to change those basic building blocks so that they have some security. Right. So let's pick a quick couple of examples to illustrate that. So who likes Homeland? Who was watching Homeland? Don't tell me you're all in the library the whole time. <laughs> you haven't got time. So let's, let's have a plot spoiler for the people who didn't watch Homeland. <laughs> the Vice President of the United States gets murdered at one point because the bad guys log in and they change his pacemaker, his heart pacemaker. Now if I had a heart pacemaker, I would probably have changed the Wi-Fi password at some point, because <laughs> I'm quite a security conscious sort of person. Not so the Vice President of the United States. He probably left it at admin, admin, or something like that. <laughs> so the bad guy is logged in and turned up his pacemaker and he drops dead. Well, I'm just saying that's one of the things that could happen if you don't take this seriously. No security means no privacy. And with all due respect, you know there's something bad coming now, right? So, so in all due respect to the people that were here for the panel discussion earlier on before this, so what? Right? I might as well have said to Nick, blah, 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 blah. Because we, we don't have this security. And so therefore, you can say what you like about your idealized versions of privacy. You're not going to have it. So we have to, so we have, to have privacy at this level. But just to go back to my earlier point, we have to have privacy at this level which makes sense in business terms. We've got to go with the grain and make things that work as a business. I, that's how we're gonna get the privacy that we want, I think, is by making it work in that way. Okay, right. So, uh, oh yes, I, I just put this in as an illustration because when I, when I was talking through the rough version of this with somebody else, they said, well, I, I'm exaggerating a bit by saying everything's gonna have a chip in it. Uh, but I maintain that I'm not. So this is a diagram that actually comes from 2005. This is a nine-year-old diagram that came for something we did for a client nine years ago, pointing out the falling cost of these chips, right? And so we're down here now, right? So the cost of those chips is already absolutely nothing. You know, we already have all of the stuff that we need to make the Internet of Things work. So don't, don't think I'm talking hypothetically because I'm not. We're, we're down there already. Okay, now, um, so let's have, I'm just going to, as an experiment, I'm going to give you three examples uh, of um, the use of those chips. And then you're going to give me three examples. Right? Because before we talk about the security bit, I just want to, I mean, we were making fun about the pans and the Scotch whiskey. You're lucky you missed the Scotch whiskey and pan stuff. Uh, I won't bother going back over it. So. Um, 
but I want you to give me three examples of it. So I'm going to give you three, right? Indonesian logs, very clever example. You have a forest of sustainable wood in Indonesia, and one of your suppliers, it's like IKEA, it's not IKEA, I won't say who it is, but it's someone like IKEA. They insist that the wood that they use comes from your supply, that comes from your um, sustainable forest plantation. And they came up with a brilliant solution for doing this. What they do is, they've got nails that have got the chips inside them, right? So what they do is they go round and they randomly, so, so the guy from the company goes to the plantation, goes to all the trees in the plantation, and he randomly hammers a nail into each of the trees, just in a random place in the tree. And he hammers it right in, okay? And then later, when the trees are cut down and shipped, they can check that the logs that are coming into their, their it's not for making furniture, it's for, it's for making um, uh, like bits of houses, basically. So basically, these, these huge logs come in, and then they have to go into these sawmills, right? And so when the logs come in, they can instantly see that the logs that they're getting are the ones that came from. And if the, if the log comes in and it doesn't have the nail in it, then, then it'll be rejected and they won't get paid for it. Because there's another clever part to this, which is if you take logs with nails in and put them into the sawmill, they bugger up the saws. So the fact that you can see exactly, so they've got the, the text, so they can read, and they can see exactly where the nail is and pull it out, and then the log goes through. This is a kind of interesting example I haven't thought of. Uh, we talked about Marks and Spencers, don't want to do that again. Um, the nightclub example I added, I thought that's a funny example, and the reason is because, uh, so this is, um, this is the Baja Beach nightclub in Barcelona. It's a happening kind of place. And the people that go to the Baja Beach nightclub in Barcelona um, don't have a lot of pockets, right? Pockets are not very fashionable at the moment. Like, you guys wouldn't know anything about this, just take my word for it. Pockets are not very fashionable about it at the moment, okay? So, uh, so what they did was, they said, if you have a nightclub loyalty card, you can have a choice of having the loyalty card as a card, boo, hiss, yawn, hello, 1940s, or you can have it as a chip injected in your arm. And I have to tell you, a great many people chose to have the chip injected in their arm. I'm not saying they're a random cross-section of the population. Obviously, these are people who are on drugs, and it's late. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, when it comes to informed consent, talking to people who are off their heads and saying, can we put the chip in now, sign here, they signed, and they had the chip put in. So now, if you're at the Baja Beach nightclub in Barcelona, and you're having a really good time, I can only kind of picture, I've never been into a nightclub, so I can only sort of picture what goes on. So you call the waiter over and you say, gin and tonic, please, my good man, or something similar. And the waiter comes back with your gin and tonic, and he has a little reader, he just taps your arm, and it goes onto your bill. Okay? Who wouldn't do that? <laughs> just that. <laughs> I beg them. Well, you know, because at, at our forum, a few years, we have an annual forum about the future of transactions. And I bet, the company that does a company called Verichip, and I begged them to come and inject me with one of these things, and they wouldn't do it. Health and safety. If you're off your head in a nightclub, no problem. <laughs> if you're trying to do it in the cold light of day, health and safety issues. You, somebody said they wouldn't do it. Who said they wouldn't do it? Why not? Happy. What? Have they got FDA approval for that shit? Well, I mean, they've got FDA approval, I think, for putting it in pigs and things. Which is, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty simple. Actually, the reason why they were originally implanted them in people was nothing to do with nightclubs. They were originally designed for Alzheimer's patients. So uh, at Alzheimer's facilities, because people with Alzheimer's tend to wander off a lot of the time, and it's very dangerous because they just want, so, so basically they chip them up, and, uh, which is a very good usage of it. And then uh, an entrepreneur saw the possibilities. Obviously thinking, somebody who's off their head in a nightclub is a bit like someone with Alzheimer's. So. <laughs> We can clearly scale the opportunity across here. Right, so there's three examples I'm going to give you. Now, I want you to give me, so I've picked three examples here, which I'm not going to tell you about, but I want you to guess. So, so let's think about cows. Who would like to make cows part of the Internet of Things? 
And give us an example as to why you think cows should be part of the index. They get stolen. They get stolen? Actually, that wasn't what I was thinking about. But <laughs> Brussels. That's, that's actually better than my answer. So, Where do they get stolen from? They get stolen now. Really? Well, like in like, the Wild West, kind of? Yeah. Who did they get stolen? They're responsible for You sneak a cow. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I know sheep get stolen. Sheep. My, sister lives, gets stolen. my sister lives up in the Cotswolds. And. Um, and sheep rustling has become a bit of a problem down there because, because there are, there are it, I didn't realize, do you know how much it costs to get a sheep slaughtered at an abattoir and made into joints? It's like nothing, it's like 10 quid or something. I didn't realize it was so cheap. My brother had a couple of sheep, that's how I know this sort of thing. And so people steal sheep and take them to these abattoirs who don't ask the right questions, in my opinion. Uh, you just walk in with any old sheep and ask them to, but you just give them the sheep and the 10 quid, you get back the lamb chops, no questions asked. I agree, it's illegal, but that's the degraded state of our nation. Um, so sheep, yes, cows, I think they're probably a bit harder to, but they do get stolen, I'm sure. Actually, that wasn't what I was thinking about. I thought it would be more amusing for our foreign visitors to understand that in England, the cows are mad. And because the, I mean, I don't mean upset, I mean insane. So in England, because the cows are mad, the government passed some laws a few years ago about how you have to track every individual cow. They, you look at cows in a field, they just all look the same to you, right? But under the law, um, we wouldn't want to step outside those boundaries, uh, you have to track all the individual cows. Because if one of your cows turns out to be mad, uh, you have to find out why and where it came from. And you have to trace its provenance uh, very individually. And this is a very complex and expensive operation. And the way, one of the ways you can do it, uh, cows don't answer to a name, for example. Then you know they're not very helpful in that sort of respect. They have you have to go and put metal tags on their ears. Um, but actually, if I was one of the criminal cow rustlers that plague the West Country at the moment, the first thing I do, of course, is take off that tag uh, and put on the tag for a, a valid cow that had already gone to the abattoir. So. Um, Cows, the solution for cows is what's called a bolus. So what you do is you put the RFID chip into a hard round ball that's about this big. Hitachi make them, they run 2.4 gigahertz because you need the longer range. Uh, you give the bolus to the cow and because of the way cows' stomachs work, uh, the bolus gets trapped in the cow's stomach. So, by the way, I'm not gonna, this isn't the children example. Okay? So I can see you were looking horrified, looking down here already. So cows, are already part of the Internet of Things right now. Uh, what about cars? Who's got a car that's part of the Internet of Things? Come on, someone's got a flash new car that's... Do, does, does, your, does your car report back to base and tell the, insu tell the insurance company if you've been staying out too late or things like that? No, I disconnected. Oh, you disconnected yours, that's why. My niece, uh, uh, when she passed her test last year, the only way she could afford insurance on, well actually strictly speaking the only way my sister could afford insurance on her car, well she has a little black box on her car which tells the insurance company if she stays out after midnight or uh, breaks the speed limit and, and various things like this. I think it's an amazing. Would you, is, that, is that a good thing or a bad thing would you say? Good for teenagers. I, well I think it's a good thing in general. <laughs> I don't think it's that much restricted to teenagers. This is why I'm looking forward to the self-driving car thing. Because I heard a thing on the Today program a couple of days ago about, oh, one day there might be self, you know, because of Google and all that, one day there might be self-driving cars in the UK. I want to live in a UK where there are only self-driving cars. Letting people drive cars is crazy. I don't know why we allow that to persist. The, you know, like there's the congestion zone. I guarantee you, in 10 years' time, the congestion zone will be self-driving cars only. Why would you let people drive, right? With self-driving cars, they'll optimize the routes, they can be cl you can pack far more cars onto the road when they're self-driving cars. When you let people get into the loop, that's madness. But anyway, let's get back to the point. You can send out automatic speeding fines. Exactly. Well, you, <laughs> you don't need to have any But they wouldn't cameras. speed. But they would never speed. No, but, but I mean, if you have the chips in the car. See, this is why, this is why we were subverting uh, the legal principles earlier on. This is the Lawrence Lessig stuff, code is law, right? There wouldn't be such a thing as speeding fines because the code wouldn't let you do it. 
right? The code would be the law. And who, who, who doesn't want to live in a country where the code is the law, right? I do. Do you write the code? Well, of course I'll be in charge of the code. That's one of the yes, you want to live there. That's one of the their advantages. <laughs> Who's got a car that's part of the Internet of Things? Whose car reports back to base? Okay, well, virtually none of you at the moment. But let me tell you, right, yours does. my car's a zip car. Yours is a zip car? I don't have a car, but I have a zip car. And they report back to base oh, where they are? Yeah. I, should, I should think so, too. So how long do you think it'll be before all of your cars are part of the Internet of Things? I mean, realistically. All the new ones are. Exactly. I mean, you're really, you're talking just really a few years, and all cars will be part of the Internet of Things. The EU's funding e haul uh, requires that manufacturers put into non-commercial vehicles emergency transponders that, on a crash, will report back to a service point. In, in, in so cars? Yeah, yeah, so it's, a, it's an easy project that... Oh, well, now I'm against it. Now it's Brussels. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, the current regulation is that by September 2015, all cars for consumers must have this in it. And currently, the number is 0.4% of all cars. Well, I genuinely did not know that, but thank you very much for that, Gillian. Okay, so that point's really easy. Okay, so all cars are coming in. What about children? You know, children should be the Internet of Things. I've been feeling guilty about this a bit recently because, because at home, our cat's got a chip in it, right? And, and, and when her brother got run over, um, the vet was able to phone us up right away because he got run over and taken to a vet. He was dead. He was taken to a vet. And the vet scanned the chip and rang us up right away and told us that he'd been run over, right? Um, but when my son was late home the other night, and I was sort of wondering where he is, right? Because he's 17. So if my son says he's gonna be home at one, and he doesn't get home until kind of like 1.30, then I, that means I have 30 minutes, assuming that he's been killed in a knife fight over drugs or you know, it's fallen asleep on an electrified railway line under the influence of skunk, or uh, whatever. Uh, I don't even care enough about my son to put a chip in him. Don't you think that's, don't you think that's wrong? Like, I care enough about my cat to put a chip in my cat. My cat's part of the Internet of Things. But I don't care enough about my children to put a chip in them. And they really should be part of the Internet of Things. Now I can, I can see there are some I can see there are some non-English people over here looking at me a bit skeptically, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yes, we know English people don't like children very much. We like to send them off to kennels at the earliest opportunity. We prefer to have the horses near the house, the dogs in the bed. This is all true, uh, but I've got some pangs of guilt about how I should be looking after my children. Why aren't children part of the internet? They were at one of the UK schools for two years. Really? They packed all of their clothes, the platinum three dimensional. That's not good enough. They need, to, they need to tag the kids. Oh, uh, well, they're doing, like, often for kind of free skill meals, you do a fingerprint, which isn't a chip, but it's kind of. Uh, yeah, but it's awesome. heading in that direction, though, isn't it? So. so well, that's right, not even for, like, concerns about your child's security, it's just for efficiency. Yeah, I'm more concerned about the security, aren't you? Wouldn't you care enough about your kids to put chips in them? You've got cut back on the number of policemen. Would you? <laughs> <laughs> That's true, actually. But but you say that, but they couldn't even find a fucking 777 <laughs> on that satellite. And so finding my son is an altogether different proposition. Uh, I used to work for NATO, but many, many years ago, I used to work at Shape Technical Center. I used to work for NATO. Um, and I sort of vaguely remember, I don't want to give them any state secrets, but I sort of vaguely remember that the radar systems they had would spot, remember the old CIA saying, you would, use, you would be able to spot a sparrow for them. Yeah. And now I realize all the agents of foreign powers have to do was jump in a bunch of 777s, and they would have come straight in. There's something very funny going on, don't you think? That should have been part of the Internet of Things, but wasn't. I hope they make them part of the Internet of Things in the future. Give me one more suggestion for something that should be part of the Internet of Things, Eric. Oh, well, I wasn't going to do that. I was going to put your children one. No, they should be part of the Internet of Things. Yeah, my point. Well, why, why aren't people doing it? Why are people not getting chips in their cats and all their children? Absolutely. It could be because people 
like what you made earlier, people don't actually trust the security of the chips. Oh, so they there we go, dragging it all back to security the cat, again. Right? So they don't care if their neighbor knows where their cat is, but, but they don't want somebody hacking into their child. Quite. So you sort of ruined the big oh, reveal on my slide. Which is these examples sound funny and silly and whatever, but if we had the security, they wouldn't be, right? So, so adding cows and cars and children to the Internet of Things actually makes a lot of sense if you have the security. You can't have the privacy without the security. I think I've labored that point enough. Let's move on because we're running out of time. Okay. So, connecting things up was easy, right? Even, ma even making cows part of the Internet of Things was easy. But disconnecting things is really hard. So putting a chip in my cat so that I can read it, as Eric just ruined this slide by pointing out, putting a chip in my cat so that I can read it is really easy. Uh, putting a, a chip in my cat so that everyone can read it is really easy. But putting a chip in my cat that only I can read, ooh, that's a bit more complicated. In fact, it's quite a lot more complicated. And the way of thinking about this, I, I think people remember stupid stories better. So, so think about the picture of the barbed wire. So the, the reason I'm using barbed wire there as a metaphor, are there Americans in the room? Are there any Americans in the room? I'm not sounding too much like a stand-up comedian, but are there any Americans in the room? You, madam, I've never seen you before in my life. <laughs> Do you have a statue, medal, post, or a flag in the honor of Joseph H. Glidden in your house at all? No. See, nobody knows who he is. Joseph H. Glidden is one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. Joseph Glidden is the New Hampshire farmer who invented the machine for making continuously rolled barbed wire. <laughs> Joseph Glidden invented barbed wire. He's one of the greatest American heroes of all time. He's virtually unknown. You know why? Because <clears throat> when America was opening up the West, I don't know if you remember the story of how all this worked, but people were given land grants. And those land grants started off at sort of 20 acres, and then 40 acres, eight. Eventually, those land grants were 160 acres and you still couldn't get anybody to go out there. And the reason was, was because in the, in the Midwest, you think I'm making this up, I'm not, it's completely true. There was no wood to make fences. It wasn't, you know, it, was, it wasn't any good giving people land if they couldn't make it their land, right? You see where this clumsy metaphor is going. They couldn't enclose it. They couldn't enclose it, exactly. You see the clever security analogy bubbling up here. Right? So until there was a mechanism of enclosing the land, the land was worthless. It was economically valueless. You could brand your cows, but you couldn't stop them from wandering around. And until you could make fences, the land wasn't an economic unit. And when continuously rolled barbed wire was in In fact, if you go to the Museum of Barbed Wire, the Museum of Barbed Wire, they naturally attach a little bit of hyperbole. But if you go to the Museum of Barbed Wire, They'll tell you it was a more important invention in terms of turning the American West into an economic entity than the telegraph or the railroad. Connecting things up is easy. Disconnecting things was hard. Okay? <clears throat> so think about the so the so you see where I'm going with this. So what what is the bar so in the Internet of Things, this new landscape, who's going to invent the bar wire that allow you see how this is all tying together now? It was, I know you were looking a bit skeptical earlier on, because you're like, you know, where's this going? But you see, the barbed wire, this is the challenge for the next generation of imperial students. <coughs> so, <clears throat> we finish by me making my tiny suggestion, which I think may have an inkling of a clue as to where to go on this. And the reason I was thinking about this was because I was trying to think about the commonality between the sort of Internet of Things and the Internet of People. Because we've done a lot of work on security around people, and, I mean, I would be the first to agree with Angela, it's got a long way to go, but there are, we have the germs of some principles and some good ideas inside that. So I thought maybe we could take some of these and generalize them over to things. And so very quickly, I'll just explain to you what I think applying these three things over here is. So the first is identification. So this is recognition. So we, we don't have to identify things. So, so for example... This is me buying a cup of coffee in the Bean in Broadway, which is one of my favorite coffee places around the corner from where my cousin lives. So in the Bean in Broadway, they have PayPal here. So if you want to buy a cup of coffee, you run PayPal on your phone, 
You go in and ask for a cup of coffee, your picture shows up on the point of sale terminal, and they give you the cup of coffee and you walk out. You don't have to give them cards or paper or any of the other old fashioned ways that you people pay for things around here. You just walk in and ask for a cup of coffee, they give you a cup of coffee and you walk out. Okay? And the reason it works is because PayPal has got your picture inside the PayPal Here application, and the person right working the till can see your picture. And that's good enough. Okay? So here's the picture that's in my application. As you can see, it's actually a cartoon. I've got the guy to take off a few pounds here. And, there. and I think that slightly more rugged shadow looks better than a beard, actually. Um, <coughs> so I could buy a cup of coffee with a cartoon of me. Right? And why not? That's good enough. My point is, it's good enough for the purposes of the transaction. So that's my first point. So when we're talking about identification, it doesn't have to be identification like anal probes and DNA. Okay? It's like good enough identification for the purposes of a transaction, which leads to the issue about data minimization. So that, maybe, maybe that's one way of getting somewhere with it. Right? I mean, maybe you don't need to know that it's my cat. Maybe you just need to know that it's a cat. Right? Maybe the little cat door on my house will only let my cat in. Right? But maybe the little cat scaring thing in your garden will just scare away cats in general. Okay? Does it need to know the identity of the cats? That it's probably not. Right? So that's the fact, like recognition. Good enough for the transaction. Maybe that's one way of moving forward. The second one, remember what the problem we had at the very beginning about the database. Who gets to look at that database? I, I go into the store and I think, that's a fantastic Chanel suit that Eric's wearing. I want a suit just like that. So I don't want Eric to know that, of course, obviously. So when he's not looking, I surreptitiously scan his suit. Oh, yeah. oh god damn. It's from Primark. <laughs> it's not a real one after all. So I'll go down to Chanel to get the real one. And when I go into Chanel, the first thing I'll do is I'll scan the suit on the rack. Is this a real Chanel suit? Yes, it is. But why would Chanel tell me that? Because how do they know I'm not a Far Eastern counterfeiting operation that's looking at the suits and taking the numbers off them? How do they know that I'm not from a rival store who's come in to do some stock taking and see how many suits I've got in stock? Because obviously I could scan the suits out the back as well. How do you decide who's going to get access to that information, right? This, this goes back to the privacy point about earlier on. So control, control over those references. Control over who says this can do what. Well, what if like maybe I can only read to find out if it's a real suit or not. That's, that's the only information I can get back. But you work for the company. So you can get back more information. You can get back some information which says, well, um, you know, it is a suit. It has these properties. You know, you should only wash it at this temperature and blah, blah, blah. You could get more of those attributes back. Um, and we sort of know a little bit about how to do that from the, from the people space. And then the third thing is the reputation. Reputation, so the history. The history of the interactions with those attributes. Reputations are much harder to forge than attributes, right? Because you have to build up the history. So, so if, I, if I just make a knockoff version of the suit, put a tag on it, put something in the database, you look at it the day and yes, it's a suit, it's a, it's a room. But if I have to see, okay, it went to this warehouse, it was shipped by that trucking company, it went to this distribution center, that's much harder to forge, right? So actually, if we move towards anchoring things on the reputations, i.e. the history of the attributes in the database, rather than these snapshots, we might get somewhere. And my point is, I think with some of the technology we already have, in particular smartphones and public key infrastructure, we already have some of the grains of the technology we need to make that solution work. And in particular, some of the, I mean, I was joking earlier on about cryptographic blinding, but this idea that you have you have something, it obtains its references in a cryptographically blinded manner. So you, you get back an attribute set, but you, it's cryptographically unlinkable to the item. Yeah? So that it makes it hard for you to forge it. That, that I think, has the root of some of these, some of these solutions. Okay? 
So, so you know, I, I know that it's a cat, but I don't know whose cat it is. <coughs> but cryptographically, not just because I can't read the stuff in the database. So I, so I think, um, now, if you think, if you think what those mean in terms of the people example, it's all about entitlements. In the people example, it's all about switching from the idea of a national identity scheme to go back to the idea of a national entitlement scheme, which we've discussed endlessly, and I won't bore everybody to hear uh, with it, unless they especially ask me to. But this is the idea that you, you, your thing, or you, demonstrates what it's entitled to do, not what it is. Okay? So we frame the problem as in, I go and look the things up in the database and find that blah, blah, blah. So let's think of an example. You walk into a pub, and you have to prove that you're 18. There's a world of difference between the pub asking who are you and then looking that up in some database, right? Using some other attributes as the proxy for what they really want, which is your age, which violates your privacy in all sorts of ways. In, in fact, the age, that was one of, always one of our favorite examples because one of the projects I worked on with Angela, I remember one of the examples that was given was uh, those driving license scanning machines that they use in bars in the US. So there's 32 states now that have the mag stripes on the driving licenses. So when you go into a bar, they get you to scan your driving license through a carding machine to see whether you're over 21 or, not, or 35, whatever it is to get a drink in America. <laughs> and there was a very, ex very famous experiment that was done. It was in Washington somewhere, not, not the, in Washington State somewhere. I can't remember where they were. And what they did was they wired up the carding machine to a display over the door, right? So people would walk in through the door into the bar, and they had to swipe their driving license to prove they're over 18. 21, 35. A light goes on, they walk through. Meanwhile, the machine has read all the other data off the driving license, like name, stuff like that, and is displaying it above the door, right? So everybody comes in, they swipe, they go and get a drink and sit down, and then they turn around and get horrified about all of the other personal data they've given up. My wife comes from California, and on the California driving licenses, it not only has name, age, eye color, it has height and weight. My wife says it's kind of more of a target weight. Really. <laughs> it's the state trying to kind of nudge you, really. Uh, but imagine what a shock it was for people when they came in and sat down, have a drink, and above the door, it's displaying people's name, age, home address, eye color, height, weight, everything else about them. There's a world of difference between asking for the identity of something and asking for the entitlement, right? You presenting a digital certificate which is cryptographically unforgeable, which says that you are over 18 and entitled to come in to get a drink, is a completely different proposition from identifying. And so I'm saying, I, I think if you're going to start some work on trying to resolve this Internet of Things paradox, I think the entitlement issue has the core of the solution. My car can drive down the road it's entitled to drive down. My cat can go through the door it's entitled to go through. My children can get the school meal they're entitled to get, uh, and, and that sort of thing. That's very different from, from tracking identities. So I hope I've left you with some, oh, how did that get in there? <laughs> Available at all good bookshops, and probably some pretty poor ones as well. Uh, but run, don't walk down to Amazon, and um, all you have a copy of this immediately. Thanks very much for listening. Dave, uh, I think we'll take just a very small number of questions because you probably all heard or saw a trolley of drinks go by a few minutes ago. Uh, so there is some refreshment available outside, uh, uh, but let's see whether we have, uh, and I'm sure Dave will stick around for a little bit. Yeah. Is anybody else going to the Ethereum meetup immediately after this? Call yourselves what? seekers after the truth and inquisitors. No. Oh, you have a question? It's a, it's a big coin. Who, who does have a question? Please. So, there's a bit of a problem between the supplier and the, the customer. So you want the security for the customer, but the supplier, because the tag on the pants doesn't care about security. So, what's it about that, That's right. That's why we have to make it work for them, too. So, so we have to find a legitimate way that Marks and Spencers can read the pants in their warehouse 
And my washing machine can read my pants, but you can't read them. And my, my suspicion is, see, if it's something to do with my washing machine having to identify my pants, then we get stuck. Whereas I, I think by doing something with entitlements, we can sort of make it work. So when the washing machine interrogates the pants, the pants don't say, I'm pants number one, two, three, four, five, six. The pants say, here's the attributes that you, a washing machine, are allowed to have. Right? So when the washing machine queries, all it gets back is wash at 30 degrees centigrade. I can, I can, that, but how do you motivate the, the, the supplier? To because, because when they interrogate it, they can get back the different stuff that they need. So it works for them too. But I, I would pay more for pants that did that, so I think that would motivate the supplier. Angela, yes, thanks. Okay, Sorry. But doesn't that limit the utility of, of things? Because like what I always said is like, you know, when people like waffle about you know, technology being wonderful and, and that they can tailor everything to me, I'm going like, well, if that was just true, I want, to, I want to be able to walk into Marks and Spencer's, right? And without having to, to reveal to, to Marks and Spencer's my height, weight, and whatever, but I want to be able to, to query the tags, and I want all the stuff that is of my size, you know, and plus the, you know, my preferences, you know, no man-made fibers, um, you know, and, and in a particular car. I want all that stuff to come hovering to me instead of like crawling around the floor, you know, turning the garment inside out to read the label, that kind of thing. So. So just saying like only, you know, if, if I put that tag in there only, I can read it. I, I think, um, so, so for example, we've done some work in a, in a similar context about blind, so, so for example, you could imagine, I'll, I'll try to use a non-Marks and Spencer's example, right? I, I've got my British Airways card and I go and get on a plane. So at that point, my British Airways card, which is a chip card, my British Airways card generates um, a, a key essentially. Uh, along with a random number, that goes to British Airways, British Airways digitally sign it, I bring it back to the card, I strip out the random number, I've now got a token which proves I'm a member of the British Airways Executive Club, but no amount of cryptography in the world will reveal that it's me. I can just prove. So I could, I could get something from Marks and Spencers, or anyone or whatever, which says, you know, I'm this height, I'm this weight, I like these colours, I don't like that particular range of clothes, but doesn't reveal who I am. Right. Um, I, no, I agree. I mean, you're, you're raising legitimate concerns. All I'm saying at this point is I think, I think the germ of an idea for doing something about the Internet of Things rests in importing this idea of entitlements. Yeah, all I'm um, saying but is that, I think it should go, you know, there should be a two-way... Two no, I agree. That mutual recognition has to work properly. Well, today, um, one of a, a rather large company, Getty Picture Library, has announced that um, you can use their pictures, and they have some absolutely fabulous ones in cool. all parts of the world, professionally, to all take by professionals. As long as you let them have all your data, as long as you let them have the, the, the information about you. Well, how would they check that? It's the thing that they are saying that. You can put your information about anybody in. What do you care? It was just like, you know, we were at a thing yesterday in Paris, I hope I'm not revealing too much about you, uh, we were at a thing in Paris yesterday. Under strict French law, you're not, there's no such thing as anonymous Wi-Fi, right? So you connect to the Wi-Fi, up comes a stream, please enter your name, address. So I put in Satoshi Nakamoto, email address, nobody at nowhere.com, hit OK, everyone's happy. Security theatre. I think with Getty, they, they link got, it in more with your address. They look, they, they connect to other databases. It's but always useful to have a, sp I, I, I have a couple of spare Facebook identities that I've been building up over the last few years, which I use in, the, it's, it's always useful to have a spare Facebook doppelganger that you can use in these circumstances. People believe Facebook, I've absolutely no idea why. Well anyway, they've announced that that's what they want That's an interesting doing. example, thanks. Please. One more. Um, I just kind of think sometimes with the kind of like proposition of saying what's on offer or you know what's coming with uh, internet of things is that will be like you know you have all these kind of things presented to you but like it seems like there's tons of chatter in there and also like your illustration of it will say you know will be underpants but you know maybe the underpants will be like oh you have to wash it at like 10 degrees with everybody else everything else will be the same color code or whatever but I really don't I only care about washing my white separately everything else can just kind of go in together and I just kind of think that a lot of it is, and then you're, if you wash it with something else, your terms and conditions will be like, you know, null and void. <laughs> so it kind of seems that, you know, a lot of it, that it seems in, in each unique instance, it seems like, yeah, that's, 
that would be an innovation, but kind of all taken together, it's a bit like, oh, if only we could, you know, just have a take a pill for dinner, would that be wonderful? And maybe we thought that in the seventies, but I don't think I I think people now are like, actually, I quite like eating lunch. If I can be sitting there and I like, you know, the texture of the food or whatever. Well, look, I don't, I don't want the only thing that people take away from this lecture to be the problem of being nagged by your underpants. <laughs> I mean, it's a real problem. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I told you right at the beginning, I'm one of the technology guys. So I'm, I'm connecting everything up, and I think I can see some of the problems, and I've got a grain of an idea as to what the solution might be. I just think that the technology but I, becomes... But I have no comfort for yeah, it. The technology yeah. just becomes something that I don't know if it's really what you know, people want, or maybe people will shape technology to suit themselves rather than... Well, they said that about Google Glasses, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> and the mixture of pity and derision that greets people wearing Google Glasses tells you all you need to know. I, honestly, I have no answer to that. I mean, I, I think, broadly speaking, the Internet of Things is basically a pretty good idea. If all the cars were connected up and all the cats were connected up, then no cars would run over my cat again, and that would be a great thing. You know? uh, but to make that work, we have to have security at this very lowest level. And so the problem that's bothering me at the moment is how can we make that bit of it work? Uh, whether we want it or not, that's, that's your business school problem, not my problem. Well, that's probably a good note to uh, end on for the moment. So if we could thank Dave once again.